Um, first, as president and um, chairman of the board of the Council for Responsible Genetics, it, it's a pleasure for me to welcome uh, this group and uh, people who have uh, spent much of their lives uh, working in social uh, and racial justice issues, uh, as well as uh, in guests who uh, have focused their work on legal uh, or uh, scholarly or history or uh, civil liberties experts, members of foundations who have, um, you know, uh, racial injustice portfolios in their, uh, uh, in their philanthropy. Uh, so we have a, quite an uh, interesting diversity of people here. Um, we are going to be focusing on the topic, which is data banking, biological samples, and DNA profiles of U.S. citizens primarily and non-citizens living and working in this country. We will also have a perspective of the United Kingdom and what they're doing in this issue. Let me say a word about the Council for Responsible Genetics. For those of you who may not know anything about the Council, <coughs> Council for Responsible Genetics has taken a lead in bringing all of you together today, but we've had a lot of support, and I'll, I'll mention a few of the people uh, who have supported us in this, uh, in, in, in today's events. Um, but um, let me say that the CRG, as we like to call ourselves, the Council for Responsible Genetics, was officially launched as a nonprofit organization in 1983, approximately 10 years after genetic engineering was, uh, was first developed in the early 70s. And out of a loosely organized uh, group of coalition of health, labor, safety, and social justice activists and scientists, the council engaged in what one writer called, <laughs> let get this term, biosocioprolepsis. How about that for a term? That's, a <laughs> just break it down. Examining with a critical eye the social implications of the new technology arising out of modern biology. Makes sense, biosocioprolepsis looking forward. We all recognize that with these new technologies comes new powers and that these powers can be used justly and democratically or they can be used unjustly and undemocratically. They can be used to give people and institutions advantages over others and without, without proper safeguards, technological powers can alter the balance between the proper role of government in protecting the safety of its citizens and that delicate civil liberties and constitutional safeguards that, uh, and guarantees that, that we think people, uh, free men and women, should have in this society. Uh, so technology can alter that balance. The issue this meeting addresses is the relatively new technology of identifying individuals through their DNA sequences. And the questions we'll be addressing so who will have access to this technology, what limits will be set on its application, what protections will be s established for misapplication, what myths have been advanced about what DNA can tell us about a person. And since the discovery of genetic engineering technology in 1973, which is now 35 years ago, many early myths about genes have been debunked. And there certainly will be more. Uh, just a few days ago, I was reading, for example, the, the myth that I've always had, you know, and thought that certainly was true. Recently, scientists reported that the genes of identical twins, identical twins, are not necessarily identical. And this is something we always thought. And as a matter of fact, in forensics, you always say, well, except for identical twins. That was the the caveat, we, you, know, you know, you can always distinguish two people except for identical twins. Well, that may not even be the case anymore. Uh, of course, we have to see that there weren't uh, a lot of study, uh, a lot of people in this sample that was studied, but uh, even a few, you know, even a f 19 identical twins, when you find out, and they were adults, that they don't have the same DNA, it makes you sit back and wonder uh, what other myths are there. So at this meeting, we'll be, we will be hearing about myths about genetic infallibility in criminal justice and in determining ancestry. Uh, 
and we have an excellent uh, group of speakers who will be uh, addressing these. So before I discuss the, uh, the meeting format and, and also get you to uh, introduce yourselves, I'd like to thank the following people. It's this, uh, this is this conference was put together by people in three different cities working uh, to get it to work. So uh, first, I have to thank my uh, two colleagues, Tanya Simoncelli and Kathleen Sloan, uh, who work together just incessantly and over the top to, to work out the details. Um, and thanks to Todd Cox and the Ford Foundation for uh, providing uh, the funding for this, for this meeting, Melissa Jamison and, uh, and the Judson Memorial Church for providing the evening events uh, tonight uh, uh, for the public forum, uh, Andrew O'Keefe and the Torch Club of NYU for hosting us last night, uh, people at the Chelsea Hotel, uh, those of you who stayed there, who knows, there might be an oral historian coming here trying to get your stories uh, for the next book that's written about the Chelsea Hotel. And uh, the new uh, director or manager, Jacob Stromandel, who made it possible for us to, uh, to get these rooms together. Mamoons for, uh, will be providing lunch today, I hope. Uh, <laughs> Sarah Thaxton, Peter Rogers, and Jill Gor uh, Gorvoy. Uh, Troy Duster, absolutely uh, hosting us here at this wonderful building uh, in a great place in at New York uh, and at NYU. Raina Rapp, also at NYU. Eileen Bowman, Dominic Bagnano, and the Institute for the History of the Production of Knowledge, which Troy is Director, are you director? Director, yes. Conference presenters, of course, Harry Levine, Duena, Full Wiley, Troy Duster, Helen Wallace, and Bill Thompson, and all the conference responders after their talks, Patricia Williams, who will be speaking tonight at the public forum and uh, commenting as she sees fit during the day, Marion Brown and Congressman John Conyers, Jr., for their interest and support of our work on this issue, and Warrant for a congressional vote, they, um, Congressman Conyers might well have been here. And the artists C.C. Chagra and Mariam uh, Meradian for permission to exhibit their murals uh, at the Judson uh, Church uh, on the Genetic Bill of Rights. My dear friend and colleague Sheila Sinclair of the CRG staff who keeps things in order and Angela Harmon, graphic designer who produced that beautiful uh, poster. And if I've forgotten you, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, there's probably others. So, um, but let's, uh, let's start with just finding out who we are. A uh, few minutes. Okay, so uh, just a word about the format. Uh, after this uh, short uh, slideshow, uh, we'll have the first speaker. The speaker will speak for about 20 minutes. There'll be a, a panel commenting on the talk, and then we'll have breakout, you know, discussion, questions, et cetera. Uh, so we thought we would just uh, throw out a bunch of concepts uh, because everybody's coming from different uh, areas, and for some of you, the this is ABC, and uh, and you may have things to say about the way it's been presented here, but. We want to, don't want to get into a debate about every concept, but uh, it's, it's to try to get a level playing field. So anyway, what do police do when they take your DNA, if they take your DNA, um, which is a biological sample, saliva, hair, blood, semen, et cetera? Well, they, from the samples, they give it to lab tech, tech, uh, technicians who can extract uh, segments of the DNA by using chemical techniques of extraction. And there are standard sites on uh, multiple chromosomes uh, which are used to obtain the profile of the individual from his or her DNA. So chemicals are used to cut the long strands of DNA at specific sites so you can extract particular sites on the chromosome. <clears throat> and they can be analyzed, uh, you know, to see what kind of letters they have, the A, G, C, T, and all that stuff that you've seen. Um, 
And uh, police can compare the DNA profile found at a crime scene with that of a suspect. Or if they want, they can take the profile that they get and they can uh, upload it into a database and see if anything on the database compares with that profile. Uh, so here's some of the things that can be collected at a crime scene or from an individual. Uh, we call these the sources of biological evidence. And in the United States, uh, typically, uh, not only is the profile made out of these sources, but the sources are also kept and maintained, and they're not uh, disposed of. Uh, so the U United States uses 13 sites located on several, a number of our 23 chromosomes. And each site is called a locus. So if you hear that word, you'll know it's at a particular site on the chromosomes. And I have some pictures a little later. And we have two pairs of chromosomes, uh, one from each parent. So there are 26 pieces of data uh, sometimes called alleles, that make up the DNA fingerprint. Uh, from the 13 sites, each site has two uh, pieces of data, two alleles from each chromosome. So here are the 13 from the uh, U.S. Uh, Federal Data Bank, and you can see that there are 22 plus uh, the uh, X and Y chromosomes, um, and um, you can see these little numbers on these chromosomes. You notice number one doesn't have a site for DNA profiling, but number two has a particular site, which is just TPOX, and um, they can actually extract uh, the DNA from that site, and they can uh, uh, measure certain things in that DNA sequence. So sometimes you'll see these numbers. They are simply the locus for the DNA identification. And then you can see they have a site on the X and Y chromosome uh, as well. Well, uh, the reason they chose those uh, particular sites, uh, there, there are three reasons. One is that there's something uh, perhaps unique about the site in that the site has um, quite high variability in terms of the repetition of certain sequences. So let's, let's suppose we have a sequence AGCT. Uh, that site, uh, among all the people, would have that AGCT repeated a number of times, but different times in different people. So I might ha have that AGCT repeated seven times. Tanya might have it repeated 13 times. It's called a hypervariable site because there's many, many variations in the population about how many repetitions of that AGCT. So it's very important <coughs> that um, they uh, find sites <coughs> that are able to distinguish amongst people. And um, so you can see here, for example, uh, AGCT in person one uh, is repeated six times. And in person two, it's repeated five times. And in person three, it's repeated seven times. So, uh, you know, that helps them distinguish different people. If, uh, especially when you have 13 sites, uh, it's going to be very improbable to get two people who have exactly the same number of repetitions in those 13 sites. So eventually, your DNA identification uh, is composed of two numbers for each of these loci. Those two numbers will be something like, let's say, uh, TPOX. It might be 13 and 7. That means that you have a repetition of the uh, short sequence 13 times in one of your alleles in that chromosome and seven times in the other one. Uh, and if you have 13 and 13, it just means that you have two alleles with exactly the same repetition. So for each of these, there are going to be two numbers. So eventually, we're all identified by a set of 26 uh, numbers, uh, like 11 and 